It's February 14th, 1938. I love you. And another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali. The Retrospectors. In the 24 years since she had penned the first ever Hollywood gossip column, Luella Parsons had been the queen of showbiz tittle-tattle. That was until today in history in 1938, when a column called Hedda Hopper's Hollywood signalled the end of Tinseltown Scuttlebutt as a one-woman show and launched an epic feud to rival Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Yeah, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons were kind of between them. What Perez Hilton is to celebrity gossip and what Rush Limbaugh is to conservatism all sort of rolled into <laughs> One. What a combination. But today in history, Hedda Hopper really turned her career from having been a bit of a struggling actress into this absolutely powerful writing force with this incredibly incendiary gossip column. And between them, at their peak, those two Hollywood women together commanded a loyal audience of 75 million readers and radio <laughs> listeners, about half of America. But to get to the point where... Hedda Hopper's column would obviously be successful because it was a rival to Luella Parsons' one. I suppose we have to start by telling you who Luella Parsons was. She had been covering the film industry since 1915. The original concept of her column for the Chicago Record Herald, which was the first publisher of it, was that the movie stars of the day would have to pass through Chicago on their way from New York to L.A., and have a two-hour wait in Chicago train station. So she pitched the editor, I'll go down to the train station and interview the stars whilst they wait for their train. And he was like, that's a terrible idea, but if you insist. (laughs) And that ended up being this hugely infectious hit because people just wanted anything, any down low on these new Tinseltown stars. Yeah, and she was very savvy as well with who she criticised and who she praised. For instance, she made a point of lavishing praise on the newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst's young mistress, Marion Davies, who was an actress, to the point that the phrase, Marion never looked lovelier, became a catchphrase to those in the know. But it did pay off because in 1925, her column became a syndicated feature across his 700 newspaper empire, which made her one of the most far-reaching voices in the movie industry. Uh, And that was great for her because she saw this as a role that needed to be filled, not just because the there was no such thing as a Hollywood gossip columnist before she came along. But also, she saw herself as a much-needed moral arbiter. You know, the 1920s were a time when Hollywood was coming under a lot of pressure for its supposed debauchery. She was a Catholic convert, and she saw herself as someone who was exposing what was going on to the public. On one hand, she was kind of in the pocket of the movie industry. You know, being the first gossip columnist, there was sort of a symbiotic relationship where she did tend to follow the studio line. But at the same time, if the studio decided that an actor was becoming difficult to control, they could unleash her on that person and she could bring down their career. She was reaching millions every single morning. Then she ended up having a radio show as well for people that didn't read the paper. Yeah, her radio show was called Hollywood Hotel. It was sponsored by Campbell's Soup. And it was the world's first sort of sneak preview show. I mean, now that seems like a really lazy way to to make any kind of broadcast, doesn't it? Take the trailer that the PR company is circulating around and play it out. But you have to remember in the world of live broadcast, this was very novel. There was nothing on tape. So what she'd do is she'd get the actors, big stars in Hollywood to appear for free because it was promotional. And they would read out bits of the scripts from their upcoming (laughs) films. And they would genuinely be paid in cases of soup. (laughs) And Hedda Hopper, who was by this stage a successful actress in her own right, was actually one of the people who was feeding gossip to Parsons for her column because she knew that she was capable of really influencing the people whose uh, ear she needed to reach. And so she was always there, happy to supply the latest tattle from her onset experiences by ringing up Parsons and explaining to her what was going on, in exchange for which she'd get loads of positive mentions uh, herself from Parsons in her column. But, you know, as it turned out, once Hopper had her own uh, column up and running, there were these amazing similarities between the two women, not least their own personal stories. They'd both escaped from small towns into seemingly advantageous marriages, only for both of them to wind up as single mothers struggling to support their only children, but both kind of triumphed by being as ambitious as they were. And eventually they did have these incredibly huge incomes each of them earning around $250,000 a year, which would be about $2 million per year in today's standards. And yet, they both had these incredibly extravagant tastes that meant that they were both constantly in debt. 
<laughs> yeah, Hedda Hopper called her Beverly Hills mansion the house that fear built, which really speaks to what their, you know, their, their special power was over the Hollywood community, is that one wrong word from them and you could be on the outs and you could never be safe either because they had networks of spies everywhere. Luella Parsons was especially notorious for this. She had contacts, you know, including hairdressers to the stars, doctors to the stars. There's a legend that she sometimes learned of celebrity pregnancies before they did. The doctor would do the test and then ring up Luella Parsons. She was the first <laughs> to break the news of the divorce of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford, who were kind of the Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman of the day, was a huge story. And it's really worth underlining that fear point that you made. So much of their power derived from the stories they withheld, more so than the ones that they ran. What weren't they saying about who was fraternising, who was having an affair, who was a closet homosexual? Those sorts of things could bring careers down, and sometimes they sat on information clearly in return for favours. I mean, most flagrantly was uh, 20th Century Fox purchasing Luella's memoir, The Gay Illiterate, for $75,000, which they were obviously never going to option into a screenplay, but it was a way of just bung her some money for shutting up about Spencer Tracy or whoever she had some dirt on. (laughs) And from Hedda's point of view, for example, uh, when she did an interview with Lucille Ball in which Lucy and Desi were talking about how they definitely weren't communists... Then presto, there she is playing herself on I Love Lucy. She's in Sunset Boulevard. So it's clearly a case of, oh, God, head us on to this story. Let's just chuck her a bone, give her a part. She wants the limelight. (laughs) But both Hopper and Parsons could be incredibly damaging in what they did publish. And one of the very famous cases uh, was when Parsons turned on Orson Welles, actually having been tipped off by Hopper. Hopper went to see an advanced screening of Citizen Kane, which of course was a thinly veiled story about Parsons' boss, William Randolph Hearst. And so Hopper tipped off Parsons and basically said, you might want to do something about this. And Parsons then went straight to Hearst and on Hearst's instructions, Parsons then threatened to expose RKO, which was the studio that made Citizen Kane, with stories of misbehaviour by its executives and even got the Radio City Music Hall premiere cancelled. And from that, Orson Welles' career never quite recovered. Yeah, and another thing that they both had in common, interestingly, was that they had both changed their names. Luella Parsons was born Luella Ettinger. She changed it because her father was Jewish and she thought that her surname was too Jewish and she never really acknowledged that part of her ancestry later in life. Hedda Hopper was born Elder Furry. You can see why she might have wanted to change that. But the reason that she changed her surname was because she got married to an actor called DeWolf Hopper. His previous wives being called Ella, Ida, Edna, Nella, and now Elder. And understandably, <laughs> he struggled to keep all the names straight. Great. So Elder <laughs> rechristened herself. She chose the name Hedda on the advice of a numerologist whom she paid $10 to suggest an auspicious new stage name. And it was <laughs> under that name that she had her career. It was a good career. She had more than 120 credits to her name. This is mostly in the silent era. And in the 1930s, she was one of the actresses who just didn't make transition to sound. One of the reasons being her age. She was in her late 40s by the time sound movies came around. And that was around the time when she got that fateful offer from the LA Times offering her a weekly gossip column. She had an extensive roster of insider contacts from her lengthy screen career. Her weakness was that she couldn't type and her spelling was terrible. So that was easily solved by having a dictate copy over the phone. It's kind of inspirational in a way, isn't it? That here is this woman who finally finds her calling when she's a 52-year-old divorcee. It's kind of inspirational that she ends up with this syndicated column. But the problem with her and with Luella Parsons as totems of women journalists is basically they were both conspiring bitchy liars. (laughs) So (laughs) if you're holding them up as your heroines, it's quite a complex (laughs) champion to have. But by the 60s, both Hopper and Parsons' influence had begun to wane, basically as the studio system was dismantled and there was also this flood of gossip magazines like Confidential and Hush Hush and On the QT and so on. But both of them soldiered on writing these whitewashed memoirs and also hosting television shows. NBC had a show, Hedda Hopper's Hollywood. You know, she had great guests like Marion Davis and Walt Disney and so on, but it's still just wasn't a patch on the heights that she reached when she was a gossip columnist. Well, it's not a surprise because by that time, the kind of star that you're getting are the kinds of star where actually the point is that the public are thinking, oh, I bet he gets up to no good. 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, this is the era of Sean Connery, right? Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what a gossip columnist insinuates because that's all part of the game by then. There's no moral turpitude. Um, Hopper worked until the day she died of double pneumonia in 1966 at the age of 80. Yeah, there's a kind of funny story about that too. Um, when Hopper died, Parsons' daughter Harriet visited her mother who was now frail and almost mute in a nursing home. R- pretty sad ending. And she walked up to her and she said, Mother, I have something to tell you. Hedda died today. After a long silence, Parsons cried, Good! <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. Delia's Cheat Moroccan Chicken. What is it, just ringing up a restaurant and ordering Moroccan chicken? (laughs) Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.